we have to start a little bit before the founding of the Fed in 1913, go back to what's called the Panic of 1907. This was one of the rather worst panics that we had had in the late 1800s and early 1900s. In this case, the stock market went down about 50%, and a lot of banks went broke, and banks just weren't lending to each other. Now, the hero at this time was J.P. Morgan. He got together with some of his other well-heeled friends, and they saw to it that lending continued, putting up some of their own money, apparently. And then, though, people realized that this was a role that should be done by the government. So after so many years, we set up the U.S. Federal Reserve System in 1913. The 1910s. The Fed initially did a form of discount lending. The Fed would lend to banks so they could avoid seasonal problems and other crises. At this time, the inflationary effects coming from the actions of the central bank were not considered important. Nor did the central bank have a role to manage the unstable economy. It was merely a lender to banks in distress. In these early years, the Fed had to deal with two things. One was the gold standard, and the other was the real bills doctrine. Let's talk about the gold standard for a second and do a little background. The world, or most of the world, was on some kind of gold standard up and into World War I and at times between World War I and World War II. Under a gold standard, paper currency was backed by gold. As more gold was discovered or otherwise turned up an economy, there would be more money and more inflation. In general, though, the gold standard kept inflation moderate. There would also be periods where not much gold was produced at all, like in the 1870s and the 1880s in the U.S., and the supply of money could not keep pace with the growing economy. Oftentimes, popularists oppose the gold standard because it would keep inflation very low, sometimes causing deflation, and making it tough for debtors. You might remember from your history classes William Jennings Bryan's famous Cross of Gold speech, which he gave on July 9, 19, 1896 at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. He wanted the country to go to a silver standard or to a bimetallic standard, which would cause inflation and help debtors like farmers. He said, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Now, getting back into the 1910s, uh, gold had a big effect on prices and credit because, to a large extent, gold was flowing into the U.S. during the early stages of World War I, at least before the U.S. entered the war, and it was causing inflation. The Fed had little mechanism to deal with this already existing macro condition. Now, the other big theory that the Fed had to deal with during the 1910s was called the Real Bills Doctrine. This dictated that the Fed should encourage real commerce and not speculation. If a bank showed up at a discount window looking to borrow, the Fed would comply if the bank were lending for some real venture. Now, this could be very pro-cyclical. When the economy was strong, there'd be more demand for credit, and the Fed would have to accommodate. The 1920s. Initially, in the 1920s, the Fed did more discount lending. Then, open market operations were discovered. Supposedly, in the early 1920s, the amount of discount lending was so minimal due to a weak economy that the Fed, which made all of its money from discount lending, started to pack its money in other securities. And then it noticed that this had an effect on private bank reserves and on short-term interest rates. By the late 1920s, open market operations were the main tool of the Fed, and the tool we use today. Again, the year 2008 is a little bit different. In 1923, just to fill out some details, the Open Market Investment Committee was created. It was replaced by the Open Market Policy Conference in 1930, and that was replaced by the Federal Open Market Committee. That was in 1935. It was part of the Banking Act of 1935, and that's substantially what today's FOMC is. The 1930s. This decade is often held up as demonstrative of a, what can happen if you have poor central bank policy. And then some other people will conclude that, well, if we learn the lessons, then we won't make those mistakes and we can have good policy in the future. Maybe both of these things are valid, maybe neither is valid, but let's try to look at the facts as best we can uh, pick them out. Coming into the 1930s, there was no consensus on what the Fed should do, either pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical policy. Or uh, even if the Fed leaders knew what they wanted to do, they really hadn't faced any major macroeconomic calamities in the 1920s that needed central bank intervention. Then, on October 29, 1929, the stock market crashed, and soon after, the economy collapsed into what we today call the Great Depression. This lasted most of the 1930s. Now, as much as this period has been studied, including by people who lived through it as professional economists like Milton Friedman, we're not exactly sure what happened. That is, what caused the Depression. Why not? Well, primarily that many factors were playing out at the same time. But we do generally think that the Federal Reserve System made two major errors. Now, at the start of the stock market crash, the Fed did act as lender of last resort and loaned money to banks who passed under brokers and other financial companies in need due to the stock market crash.
But the economy was deteriorating, and starting around the end of 1930, banks started to fail in large numbers. People pulled their money out, and banks were short of funds. Concerning this crisis, the Fed failed to lend to banks. In fact, in October 1931, the Fed raised the discount rate. Later, it lowered the discount rate, but by that time, the lowering had no effect because the discount rate was usually higher than market rates in short-term lending markets. So the Depression continued, and later in the 1930s, the Fed got the authority to change reserve requirements. In late 1936 and early 1937, the Fed increased reserve requirements, causing banks to want to hold too much excess reserves. Banks tended to hold excess reserves perhaps because they feared bank runs. Then, in 1937-38, there was some economic growth, and it looked as though the country was coming out of the Depression, but there was another recession, and it kept the uh, longer-term Depression going on. Now, the conclusion is that there were at least two major mistakes by the Fed during the 1930s. One was not doing the discount lending, and the other one was raising the reserve requirements. Some people make the case that there were others. For example, in April 1933, the U.S. went off the gold standard. Some analysts think gold flows contributed to the Depression, the U.S. was running a trade surplus and bringing in gold. They should have increased the money supply and stimulated the economy. But wary of this typical inflationary effect of gold, the Fed worked to offset the increases in money. This was a typical central bank response to an increase of gold, but not appropriate for the times. So the conclusion on the Depression is that the Fed definitely did some things wrong, but there were a lot of other things going on at the same time, and it was hard to tell which thing was dominating which. The 1940s. In September 1939, World War II started in Europe, and in December 1941, the U.S. declared war. A major war, of course, can alter normal market relations and require special bank policies. From 1942 to 1951, the Fed pegged interest rates. The Fed committed to buy Treasury bills at 0.375%. Treasury bills are short-term U.S. debt, and longer-term U.S. bonds at 2%. This was to help finance the war. This peg started in April 1942 and held until 1947. The Fed achieved the peg by doing sufficient open market operations, that is, buying bonds. If it kept buying bonds, it would keep the yields of bonds down. Of course, the Fed could then not control its monetary policy. The money supply would be expanded against the wishes of the Fed. Later, high inflation caused the Fed to want to switch to managing the money supply. There was a power struggle now between the Fed and the Treasury, which liked the peg, uh, the peg policy because it kept borrowing rates low. Eventually, in the early 1950s, the Fed prevailed and got its monetary policy back. The war ended in 1945, and the U.S. and other nations of the world were determined not to go right back to the high unemployment of the Depression. In the U.S., we passed the Employment Act of 1946, which specified goals for economic growth, employment, and price levels. There were also international agreements, like the International Agreement on Exchange Rates, known as Bretton Woods. Now, at the end of the war, many analysts were expecting a return to Depression conditions. Also, at the intellectual level, at this time, most intellectuals believed capitalism was a failed system. Uh, perhaps as strongly as people today think socialism is a failure, people back then thought government management of economies was relatively successful. Much of the world was communist, emerging nations were leaning communists, many European nations were socialist, and few nations were capitalist. To summarize the 1910s to the 1940s, they contain a lot of really interesting history and a lot of case studies in how things played out in that period of time. But I think they're all pretty much special cases, and they don't really teach us a lot about how we try to manipulate credit today with our central bank. And so what we know about them, including what we know about the Depression, might not really teach us a lot. So I don't mean to denigrate people like Ben Bernanke, but Ben Bernanke gave a, a speech on the 90th birthday of Milton Friedman, and this was in 2002, and Bernanke concluded by lauding Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz that they were right about what happened in the Depression and that we've learned some lessons. Here's a quote from that speech at the very end of the speech. I would like to say to Milton and Anna, regarding the Great Depression, you're right, we did it, we're very sorry, but thanks to you we won't do it again. And that may be true in a way, but the problems we face today are different, and maybe the lessons from the 1910s, 20s, or 30s, or the 1940s won't help us a real lot.